Welcome to the show, and thanks so much for joining us. Well, here on 700 Club Interactive, we have a segment where we answer your questions that are sent in. Uh, so let's get to it. Yeah, absolutely. So just like this viewer on YouTube, they commented and asked on our social media, I've heard preachers and others talk about religious spirits and traditions as a negative thing. What is a religious spirit and how is it affecting the local church? So I think we should first, I feel like this is a two-part question. So the, the, the first one, <laughs> the first one, <laughs> the first one you is deal with traditions talking about religious spirits and traditions. So are religious spirits and traditions, are they the same thing? Or are they different? They're not. They're different. Yeah. Uh, I actually like church tradition. Um, you know, I grew up Baptist and we were sort of, you know, we, we, it was all about the pulpit preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you dive into the Book of Common Prayer, which is a wonderful English, uh, that's from the Anglican Commun Communion, it's, it's, a, it's, it's filled with really good theology. And you can look at uh, traditions as a way to organize the calendar and organize your life. The good thing is when you follow the tradition, you know you got your bases covered. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I like it. I've, I've Done, done a lot of research on it. it it's great. Uh, those old vines can still get filled with sap and still produce mm. fruit. So, yeah. Yeah. yay. Mm -hmm. Religious spirits are another thing. And when you, let's look at the words of Jesus from Matthew 16, uh, verse, verse 6. Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what's going on, you know, leaven is something that sort of permeates invisibly and causes everything to puff up. There, Jesus uses leaven in a good way to say you know, it's like the kingdom of God gets into the loaf and makes everything rise. Uh, and so it's a symbol of God's love can, can really improve everything. But here he's taking it in a negative way yeah. that leaven can affect everything around it uh, because it's permeating it with the wrong doctrine. Mm. For the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that doctrine was, it doesn't matter if you're greedy. It doesn't matter if you like the, the best positions in the temple, if your heart's not right with God, if you're doing the outward thing, mm. if your behavior yeah. is in accordance with the Torah, it doesn't really matter what's going on in your heart. So that's the leaven of the Pharisees, and I would submit uh, that is what pastors are talking about when they say religious spirits. It's a spirit of legalism, yeah. where you're more concerned about do women have makeup or are they wearing jewelry, and you're not concerned about what's really in their heart. Definitely. And, and you get very judgmental. The Pharisees and Sadducees were very judgmental. Um, Jesus wasn't judgmental. He was known as a friend to sinners. Yeah. And he was constantly showing people there's a better way to live. You don't have to live trapped in your sin. You can walk out free. Yeah. And instead of condemning people for what they were doing, he was always inviting them to a much better life. Yeah, I mean, he called them whitewashed tombs. So what is inside of a tomb? I'll ask you a question. <laughs> How about that? Oh, death, death. Yeah, exactly. Somebody who is not alive. So he was calling these Sadducees and Pharisees, you're dead on the inside. From the outside, you might look perfect, but you're far from God. And so I think that's what most pastors and preachers will, you know, encourage believers everywhere to not do and to, to come against Well, them. I'll give you one example of what a religious spirit does, and it's from the Bible where you tithe of your mint. I mean, you, you tithe of, of even the herbs in your garden and you give it 10% of that. Uh, and, but at the same time, you declare whole portions of your money as Corban, which meant that this is dedicated to the temple and it can't be touched by my relatives. So you're actually violating one of the commandments, which is honor your mother and father. Mm -hmm. You were separating your estate so you wouldn't have to use that money to take care of your own parents. Mm -hmm. uh, where's your heart in that? Yeah. Uh, so you were, you were trying to say, I'm so observant of the Torah and I have set aside as Corbin a yeah. uh, portion of, of my income, my, my entire net worth is, is going to the temple, but you're not taking care of your own parents. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Well, I guess another good question is, is tradition a bad thing? Because let's be honest, the Christian church has also, and I would, you know, submit uh, Judaism as well, 
takes tradition as authoritative as 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 authoritative as scripture. Yes. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> uh, I disagree with it. Um, within Judaism, uh, the oral tradition mm -hmm. uh, has equal weight, uh, as does the local council of, mm -hmm. of the synagogue. Uh, so you have a question, you go to your synagogue and you get a ruling mm -hmm. uh, from them. Within Judaism, there is a scripture-only movement. Uh, let's go back to the original scripture. Let's not add to it. Uh, Jesus actually condemned adding more burdens than was mm -hmm. were required. Wow. Uh, if you look at, at scripture, there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Um, yeah, I've come to realize I have trouble keeping all of them. Uh, so I, I need a savior. Um, yeah. w when you start adding on burdens to people, and, and I, I, I just, I, yeah. there's something in me that rejects that. The number one thing you need to do, are you loving God? Number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, are you loving one another? If you're loving one another, if you're loving the people around you, if you're loving the people who are really hard to love, if you're loving your enemy, well then, yay, um, you are fulfilling all the law and the prophets. That's what the New Testament says. So let's stand fast in that liberty mm -hmm. where Christ has made us free. How do you get to the place where you can love your enemy, where you can forgive those who have really hurt you? If you try to do it on your own effort, you say, I'm gonna have the willpower to do this, uh, you're probably going to miss the mark. But if you say, Jesus, I'll let you love them through me. Yeah. And you, and you turn all of that over to, to him. Jesus, I want your righteousness, not my filthy rags. I want you. Could you act through me? Could you live in me? Then suddenly it gets very, very easy and very, very good. Amen. All right, guys. Well, if you would like to ask us a question like uh, somebody just did or give us a topic to talk about on the show, make sure you visit our social media pages. Look for the posts on different platforms such as Facebook and Instagram and even YouTube on the community tab at 700 Club Interactive. You can also visit our YouTube page for extended interviews and stories and clips like this. Gordon? And you can like and subscribe. And like and subscribe. <laughs> Coming up next, a sobering new poll about religion in America. Fewer and fewer preteens have a biblical worldview. Stay tuned to find out how parents can reverse this troubling trend. 67% of American parents with pre-teenagers identify as Christian. Of that number, only 2% possess a biblical worldview. Brody Carter brings us the details on a new study that should be a wake-up call for the church. Most of the parents of young children in America today if they were to die today, probably would not wind up in heaven. It's a bold statement stemming from a study led by esteemed Christian researcher, Dr. George Barna. It suggests American parents are experiencing a dilemma. Most people die with the same worldview in essence that they had at the age of 13. That's why Barna is concerned in stressing the importance of sharing a Christian worldview with children. The study found while 67% of American parents with preteens identify as Christian, only 2% actually possess a biblical worldview. They don't believe the Bible is reliable or true or relevant to their lives. They don't have the same view of God as is given to us in the Bible. I mean, it's very sobering uh, from a Christian perspective and a Christian worldview. It, it, it's sad, yet it's not uh, a surprise. The numbers show only 1% of this parent group in Catholic and mainline Protestant churches have a biblical worldview, compared to just 9% in evangelical, charismatic, and non-denominational churches. It's been on the decline for more than 25 years now, and it's getting down into the very low single digits with each succeeding adult generation. As millennial parents become the majority, Barna worries those numbers could get worse, as they're seen as being least likely to have and share a Christian lens. This is a generation that needs a lot of attention and a lot of help they don't respond well to somebody saying, but the Bible says, mm. or trying to force biblical principles upon them. What they do relate better to are conversations, non-judgmental, non-threatening conversations. The study points to a number of reasons for this result, including no-fault divorce, secularization of news, art, and entertainment. It adds that public schools and governmental laws foster a culture where wisdom and biblical truth have little room to grow. 
really culture has done a great job of messaging the fact that, hey, let's just live free and limitless and, and let's just be happy. You have the right for things for yourself. And we've created ultimately a really consumer focused culture. Dr. Danny Huerta with Focus on the Family is dedicated to helping families know and grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity, a wake-up call for the church to uh, make sure we're teaching the, the truth in Scripture and going back to that, to the principles and believing everything that the Word of God says is true. No one has disproved it to be wrong. For parents who feel like they're falling short in this area, where to recommends to intentionally enter faith-based conversations with your kids, learn what biblical boundaries look like and implement them. And he adds, it's going to take practice. So a book I wrote is Seven Traits of Effective Parenting, and that's based off of research on what a parent can focus in on rather than trying to control a child or trying to uh, take ownership of, of a child's behaviors. It's about influence, and that begins with you. Does that mean that Christianity is going to go away in American culture. And to make that argument, you would have to believe that God has given up on America. And yet the reality is we have a remnant of about 15 million adults across the country who possess a biblical worldview. That's a huge remnant. So God could certainly use them to turn around this culture. Brody Carter, CBN News. That is a disturbing trend, but we've seen it coming for decades now. Uh, when, when we took God out of the schools back in the 1960s, and now we somehow think it's unconstitutional to teach children how to pray or to teach children the Bible, uh, then as a natural consequence of that, they're, they're going to grow up without a biblical worldview. And then you add to it the, the children that went through the 70s and 80s and 90s are now having children of their own. Well, they don't have that core to teach their own children. So we're reaping what got sown in our culture. And is our culture better uh, as a result? And I would submit absolutely not. If you lose sight of the knowledge of God, Lots of really bad things will happen to you, and you don't have to read far into the book of Romans to see the whole list. So when you start looking at the, the amount of murder and violence and these things that are in our culture today that, that unfortunately seem all too commonplace, and we're left to just sort of count the body to totals, we have to take it back to the source. When you take God out of the equation, God is the one who restrains this kind of activity, uh, restrains behavior, and brings people to a point where can we love God, can we love one another, and realize that that's a really good goal and that's a really good culture to live in. If you're having trouble figuring out how to transmit the Bible and a biblical worldview to your children, I've got a real easy solution for you. It's called the Superbook Bible App, and here's the best part about it. It's absolutely free. And when you get it, you'll get the stories of the Bible in animation in a way children can understand. It's aimed at children that are age 6 to 12. Uh, parents can enjoy them too. Maybe you can learn about the Bible as well. And you'll see it in an entertaining way. Uh, there are more than 60 episodes. We're trying to bring it in over 80 languages. Uh, and we're trying to get the stories of the Bible, not just here in America, but to the children of the world. So have your children be part of that and just put it on a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, you can really trust them and, and you, the, the kids seem to really love it. So it's a great way to teach the Bible to children. Yeah, I was just going to also mention with that story, um, I was a part of that statistic. Before I came back to the Lord, I was a Christian, but I did not have a biblical worldview. And it, you know, I don't want to put the blame on parents, but it's very important to, you know, bring your kids to church. I'm not saying, mom and dad, if you're watching, you guys brought me to church. I made my own decisions. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it, it is really important to have conversations. It's important for you being mom or dad, whether you're a single parent or not. Um, you know, having that personal relationship with Jesus, because when when the children see that, you know, it automatically they want to reflect that as well. They see Jesus inside of you, whether you're my mom or my dad. And so they know 
Um, and then, you know, that will inspire them and encourage them to follow after Jesus, uh, too. I've got to ask. Your grandparents are Christian. Yes. Parents are Christian. Yeah. But you grow up in a Christian household mm -hmm. and you don't have a biblical mm -hmm. worldview. Why? I will say it's the culture. It definitely is the culture. Um, I, you know, mainstream media is highly sexualized. It is anti-God 100%. Um, and just not really being surrounded by other peers, friends who have biblical worldviews um, would go to church on Sunday. But again, I just didn't have that until I had a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the game changer. Once you know Jesus intimately, then you're like, aha, you have that aha moment. And um, then everything changes for the better. And then from better. that, uh, your aha moment led you to a hunger for scripture. Yes, absolutely. And you became a uh, really dedicated Bible yeah. student. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you yeah. know, you're you're very much a self-starter on yeah. this. So if, you know, parents are watching and you're, you're like, well, I teach my children scripture and I do this, but they still don't choose to believe. Again, you know, it's not all on you. It's the culture that we live in, but just pray for your children because I am where I am today because of the prayers of my mother, of my father, my sister, my grandparents. So don't give up on your children and don't give up on the younger generation. There's amazing women and men of God who are doing really cool things on TikTok and social media where the younger generation is, and they're preaching the gospel with fire and boldness like I've never seen. So, yay. Yeah. Yay. There's hope. All right, I got to stop talking. Okay, coming up, a mom's agonizing decision telling her son to pack his bags. Why did she do it? And what finally brought this family back together? Well, you'll get those answers next. CBN presents Putting on the Armor of God, a brand new audio recording by Pat Robertson. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Become a CBN partner. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com to receive your copy of Putting on the Armor of God, available now. Well, in her own house and under her nose, Nancy Chalmers' son got hooked on drugs. His addiction escalated from pills to cocaine to heroin. And soon, Nancy learned that he was also forging prescriptions to feed his addiction. Nancy spent countless hours crying out to God, and she soon realized that her son wasn't the only one who needed to be saved. Was beginning to... Um to appear that Andrew wasn't around anymore. It wasn't my son that was walking in the door whenever he came. And there wasn't really any point in listening to what he said because none of it was true anyway, or it was so mixed up with truths, who could tell? From the outside, Nancy Chalmers and her family seem to have everything figured out. We've always attended church. We, we grew up that way. I just always incorporated what we call the American dream into that. You know, all those dreams you have to uh, have the perfect little house, the perfect children. I thought it was just the way you live. When her son Andrew got older, he claimed to have ADHD. This would require prescription medication. But Nancy soon became suspicious because he kept changing doctors. She decided to go with him when he had a new appointment. He comes out in 22 minutes with five prescriptions. That will take your breath away. He'd sell half, use half. Have money to go pay another psychiatrist. Andrew moved back in with his parents. Soon things began missing around the house. Your spoons, like, used to have 12 spoons in this drawer. What are happening to my spoons? Didn't dawn on me. I mean, I knew he, he did the pills but I didn't have any idea he'd gone to cocaine and then he'd gone to heroin. I, I had no idea about that. And he had an alibi for everything. And you keep wanting to fix it. Surely we can find the right doctor, the right situation. I didn't really have hope that God healed it. I, I didn't see any healing growing up. I, I saw people learning to live with their condition. 
and thinking how sad my family stuck with this. We felt like we were doing the right thing, giving him a safe place to live because you, you know, you don't want him to go live with a bunch of people, you know, and, and get worse. And all the time, praying and crying, I would spend hours in my closet upstairs. Asking God to grab hold of him, change him. The Lord showed me that I was as sick as my son. My need to please, my need to make things all right, my need to fix, not have anyone think badly of me, all of those great needs that we have, we've built our own little tower of who we are, just came crumbling down. I realized I lied to myself and other people all the time, which placed me right at the same foot of the cross that Andrew was, the same level. Then Nancy received a letter that made her realize she couldn't pretend everything was fine anymore. And I'm opening the mail as I come in and uh, looks like an invoice from a psychiatrist. And I just sit down, the first chair I can get, and it blows me away. He said, here are copies of prescriptions that I did not write. And it was on his prescription pad paper. The accusation really was that Andrew had written the prescription. I knew we were done. We were done. I said, Andrew, God has just told me that we are doing you more harm than good. Here's the accusation from your psychiatrist. Get your book bag, whatever you want in your book bag. Get it out of here. You cannot live here anymore. You have to leave. Andrew moved out, and Nancy began to question her decision. I got out my Bible, and I just said, God, I think I heard you say that. If I was wrong, please let me know. And I just flipped it open, and it opened to Jonah. And I read it. And God said, you're the people on the boat. They knew they were all going to die if Jonah wasn't thrown overboard. And it was like, so I was the one that had to do that? Me? The person who can't face the truth, much less tell it? Nancy continued to pray for her son. For three days, they didn't know where he was or if he was alive. Then he called asking for help and agreed to join a program called Teen Challenge. He just changed him and he got him on his knees in total surrender. There is a healing time after addiction. Forgiveness is not trust. Nancy's experiences inspired her to write her book, No One Visits the Mother of a Drug Addict. We need Jesus to restore our soul. Not wear the clothes and the makeup and look like you got it together, but be vulnerable and say, I am not doing well. No one visits the mother of a drug addict because you don't tell them. You don't tell them. After years of healing, Andrew started a ministry called Take the City to help mobilize churches to reach people in their communities and see cities changed for God's glory. We're working together now. That is quite interesting to work for your son. Um, and quite a joy, and that connection is coming back. Just take it all, Lord, because you're going to weave it together to turn it into something so amazing, because that's your job, not us, and our children are his job. When you give him something, he can do anything with it. What an encouraging story. I'm just reminded as I watch that story that the cross is the great equalizer. Here's Nancy, and she said that the Lord brought her to the foot of the cross, the same place that her drug-addicted son was at, because the Lord revealed to her that she was just as addicted as her son. It was different, though. 
She was addicted to pleasing others. She was addicted to coming off as she has it all together. And how many times have you and me, because I, I, I have a tendency to be a people pleaser as well, and sometimes it's poison to our souls because in that position, we don't come to the foot of the cross because deep down we think that we're supposed to be perfect to come to the cross and God would never accept anything less, but that is a lie from the pit of hell. Come to Jesus the way you are and he will do the rest. He's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to get real with yourself and to get real with him because it's in that heart position of God, here I am, my brokenness in all. It's in that heart cry that God is able to do a miracle in your life, just like you saw in that story with Nancy and her son. So if you're at that position and you're feeling something inside of you, I believe it's the Holy Spirit telling you, it's time to get real with God. It's time to get real with Jesus. So if that's you, just pray this simple prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I come to you. God, I am being honest with you and I don't want to people please anymore. God, I'm struggling and I need your help, Lord. Show me the way, show me the path of light, life. Heal my heart, Jesus. I cry out to you, I believe in you, Lord. Do it, God. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. If you need more prayer for anything at all, please give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. We are always ready, willing, and able to pray for you and your needs. Gordon? Well, we leave you with these words from Psalm 86, and this is a word for everyone. But you, O oh Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. May his love and faithfulness fill you to overflowing. God bless, we'll see you again. Hello, I'm Gordon Robertson. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more encouraging videos like this one. Welcome to the 700 Club Interactive Family, and God bless you.